Introducing the Plasma Series Ecto-1. And today we're going to show you how to make it look more movie accurate by adding lights, working switches, make your own accessories, and showing you some tricks like how to make solid pieces like this transparent glass. And even clever ways to charge your Ecto-1. But first, this is your Geek Fix. So, with the new Ghostbusters movie coming out, I thought to myself, you know, I really ought to do something for it. Something to celebrate it. I mean, this is one of my favorite franchises. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it was hard to decide what to do. I mean, I could get a Spirit Halloween Ghost Trap and upgrade it, but uh, that's been done by everybody. I was going to go ghost hunting with a working PKE meter, but... Uh, the pandemic canceled that. But when I thought about it, really, the thing that I wanted most from Ghostbusters since I was a little kid was my very own Ecto-1. Sure, I'd love to have the 1.6 scale Blitzway version, but that's between four and $6,000. Uh, I could get the Eagle Moss Build Your Own Ecto-1 that's 1.8 uh, scale, but uh, that's about $1,500. Uh, I, I could also get the Hot Wheels 1.18 scale version that is uh, somewhere nowadays between $175 to $400. So, what would be under $100? Then I found this Plasma Series Ecto-1 that's from the new movie that's also 118th scale. The Target released for about $50, and uh, that's a great price. Of course, at the same time, months before the movie even came out, this had already been sold out because, of course, people bought it to resell it, and they were reselling it from anywhere from about $75 to about $300, uh, which is sad and ridiculous. For this reason, I had to go to eBay and luckily did find this one that was also about $55, I think, in the end. And uh, at the same time, looks like it came from the barn where they uh, found the car. It's, it's pretty battered on the outside, but was listed as new, so hopefully everything's intact on the inside. And as you can see on the back, there's a lot of moving parts and details that are really good, including opening doors and the gunner seat that shoots out, and a lot of the details on the top are, are perfect too. It's not exactly movie accurate, but at the same time, it has all the bones that I need to be able to make something that looks really good. Now, luckily, because this is 118 scale and the Hot Wheels version was also 118 scale, there was already a lot of lighting kits that are out there. And one of the more popular ones is the one by Tenet Controls. But that's also really expensive. And so I was looking for something a little bit cheaper that would give me a lot of the same effects. And in the end, I found this set by Evans Designs, which is about $40. Not only does it light up the car uh, with the flashing lights, but it also has a siren that will play and two switches to be able to turn them on and off. So I thought that was a pretty good deal and that's the one that I got. One thing that I also noticed about this model is that there is no tint on the windows. And I know in the movie trailers it was hard to tell, but I know by looking at a lot of the reference photos and watching the review by Adam Savage that there is definitely some tint that's still left on the windows. It's just been cracked off at this point. And so I got some of this very light tint uh, that I can put on and give that crackly look to. Another thing about most of the cars that I listed is that they came with a gurney for the proton packs and uh, this one does not because in the new movie I don't even think that that's a thing. But I wanted one so I was able to find this 118 scale gurney uh, which I plan to uh, make look a little bit more like the uh, proton pack carrier. I also got some paints and some other things I'll talk about a little bit later. But for right now, first thing we need to do is to uh, open this up and check it out. And now it comes with the car on the inside. Plus it looks like it has some of the parts are separate at the moment. So it's not fully assembled, but for the most part, it's all put together. Uh, I'm gonna grab these snips here and 
Now, there are two versions of this car, and I mean that in two different ways. First off, in the movie, the original movie, uh, the Ecto-1, uh, that is a different car than the, was inside the second movie, which is the Ecto-1A. Uh, the difference between those has to do with some of the decaling on the side. Uh, you also have the change in the uh, ghost uh, buster symbol. Uh, the second one had the two, and uh, the second one also had the 1A had the symbol right here, and these vents right here were not on it. So the way that we know that this is probably just the Ecto-1, the very first version, is that these vents are here and there is no Ghostbuster symbol over here. Also, the other stuff that was on top of the other one uh, isn't present. Another way, though, that there are two cars has to do with uh, this area and a lot of the detailing on it. Um, one problem with uh, one of the versions that came out is that it has too much of an overburn on the front uh, to the level that people have complained you can't see any the uh, details on it and so uh, they've gone through and cleaned it up. I kind of wish I'd gotten that version so I could show you how to do that but basically just using some hydrogen peroxide or uh, some Z's cloths you can actually wipe this down and it does bring a lot of that off. It does also appear that it scratches pretty easily so I do have some scratches on here and, uh, and it kind of shows now there's also some other details that come inside, like this. Uh, so we've got the top of the car has all these details. Um, and then there's also some more parts over here in the front, which includes all my hoses and my ladder. Uh, that is one big difference between the Ecto-1A and the first film and the new film, which is that they had to move that ladder. So the original ladder went over here on this side of the car and they had to move it and the reason for that is because of this door right here so <laughs> there it goes so the door opens up like so so that the gunner seat right here can come out and uh that's cool and all but at the same time that meant that they had to change the direction of the door as well as how much it opened and that meant that they had to move that ladder out of the way so it went to the opposite side um, but if I did want to put it back the way that it was originally this hosing which has been deviated for the ladder uh, I kind of thought would be hard but it's not it's rubbery and so for that reason I can actually I could actually put that uh, over here still and and not have to uh, have it moved around like it is in some of the new movie. Another detail that comes with the new car is this little RC trap which has a feature inside of the new film. It even rolls and uh, so that's kind of neat. Uh, that goes inside the back of the car. One of the complaints that I commonly heard was that the wheels were plastic and that people wished that they were rubber and a little bit more detailed and looked a little bit more like the real ones. On the flip side, this might also have to do with this version uh, that I got uh, produced with, the, with less of the paint on the front, is that mine are rubber. And so they are not plastic. They're only plastic right here on the sides. And so um, I'm kind of surprised about that. So I don't know if that's just my version. But I did purchase some Firestone 118 scale tires that are white wall and uh, that are closer to replicating the actual movie tires. So, so I could replace those. So I could at this point, I, I could uh, go ahead and put everything, all my details on just to kind of see what it looks like. But I think instead, what I'm gonna do is go ahead and take it apart so that we can start doing some detailing on the inside and uh, light it. So once when I unscrewed the bottom, it seemed like everything was really easy to take out or to uh, pop off or unsnap. And I was feeling pretty confident about being able to take it all apart. I got to these fins and I saw that there's actually a clip underneath the window indicating that uh, they were slid in and then snapped in. But at the same time, this is where I started to see that they were also gluing parts on. And so that meant that I couldn't just pull these off without breaking something and decided to leave that alone. Also, these sirens on the top, you'll see have a lot of glue around the posts. And so there's no pulling those off without ruining them possibly. So I left those alone for the moment as well. Now getting to the front and back bumpers where all of our lights are located, 
The common thing that you'll see with models is that they will be a single piece and they're solid. So that means that you can't just light them through. You need to do something with those lights first. These backlights are already pretty accurate, at least to the actual car, because that car was the 1959 Cadillac Miller Meteor Future uh, uh, Duplex. And in that car, has not lights back here, but instead reflectors. And so I could just leave it the way it is and, and it would be accurate in that sense. But I noticed that when I look at all the posters for the new movie, as well as watching some of the scenes and some of the scenes from the original movie, that they seem to be lit up. And I don't know if that's because they were shining lights on them uh, to be able to pick up things a little bit better and it just appears to be lit up or if they went ahead and installed the actual lights because you got to consider that the only things that will light up on the back of the car are these bullet lights and that's not very much light and so for the most part that would mean that the back end of the car would be dark a majority of the time so for that reason i've decided i'm going to go ahead and create lights on here just to kind of make it look a little bit more interesting but how? How are we going to do that? How are we going to take these solid parts and make them have clear areas for the lights? So my idea was that I would make some molds uh, of these parts first off. And uh, so to do that, I had a couple of options. I mean, you can get all sorts of silicone molds out there, mold making uh, products. The ones that I'm working with are aluminite. I like these, or the reason why I got these is because I can get them for 40% off at times at Hobby Lobby, and so I paid much less than I would for even uh, other products. This one I was particularly interested in because it's supposed to be very fast acting. You're supposed to be able to, to set it pretty quickly, and it's supposed to be really flexible and extremely, in fact, it says extremely flexible, but, uh, at the same time, I've never used it before. Now, the way that most of these things work is that there's exactly one part to one part. So you're mixing equal parts of both the base and the catalyst, and then they set and, and go from there. The problem with this one is that the instructions that came with it said that I should stir it for up to five minutes and, uh, and that it sets for much longer than, than what I was originally told. It was only supposed to take 30 minutes. So I stirred it and I stirred it and, and really the way that this works is that this one, once when you mix the two well enough, they turn pink. Once when it turns completely pink, you should be ready to pour. I stuck with the instructions, kept stirring and it turned into a more solid uh, state than I needed it to be. And at that point I knew I was out of time, but went ahead and threw it on really quickly. And sure enough, 30 minutes later, I was able to demold it. But as you can see, and as I suspected, I had big bubbles, which ended up making these lights not really usable. So for that reason, this mold wouldn't work for me, but I wish it had because it does set very fast and it's pretty accurate. If you look right here on my mold, you can actually see the numbers from the sticker for the license plate. So that's pretty good. So I had to start over. And this time I decided to use the mold that came with this kit, uh, which these kits are pretty good. Again, if I can cut the price in half, even just by themselves, uh, they come with the equal amounts of what I would normally use or buy, and uh, it's a discounted rate. So yeah, it's a pretty good deal. Now the box does come with some putty for being able to place around these parts, because as you can see on the sides of the bumpers, they stick out enough that I'm gonna have to flatten things out before that. I got some silver putty because I figured that way when I pulled it off, if any stuck to the bumpers, at least it wouldn't ruin the color. Once when I had a pretty good base and I also built the sides from cardboard box, which would make it easier to peel off afterwards, I was ready to try my second mold. This time it also says five minutes and this time that was very true. I stirred it for about five minutes after I poured both the base and the catalyst in in equal amounts and then I poured it onto my parts. Unfortunately, this mold is not going to set as quickly. Uh, this mold took about 18 hours actually to set 
And so that means I'm gonna just leave it alone for a little while while I do some other things. I wanted to detail the inside and some of the individual parts while I was waiting. And so I used one of these sticks that you can actually get at the dollar store. It's a sanding stick for nails. It has some sides that are pretty rough. It has different grades of sandpaper on different parts of it, really smooth on this side. And so I just took that and went around on my model and just sanded it to the point where it kind of got a little bit rougher. It looks a little dusty and adds a little bit more detail to some of these seats, for example, and on the dash. I used to use some Gundam markers to be able to add some silver details and scratches. I used this pencil set right here to go around my computers and some of the other areas and add some coloration and, and detail. For example, on these tanks right here, I added some rust that's kind of coming down the sides just like I could see inside my reference photos. I also printed some stickers, which I got from multiple sources. Mostly what I did is I went onto all the forums for upgrading a real car into an Ecto-1 and you will find plenty of pretty high resolution stickers. Plus, I was able to look up some of the items that are on the car that they use to make it look the way that it does and found the actual stickers that go to them. For example, the radio up in the front, I found the actual sticker that goes on the back of that radio so I could stick it on and just add some detail to it. I painted my gurney and also modified it, cut off the side pieces and the little holder and used some plastic tubing to extend the parts that are now gone and 3D printed the part to hold the proton packs. So once when my mold was dry, it was ready to be removed from the box. Uh, like I said, all I have to do is just tear off these sides here and then peel off all of the putty and in the end, we have something kind of smells like coffee for some reason. It has a, has a smell to it. So now that I've got a mold of what the lights look like, I'm going to now remove the light areas from those parts. And it really isn't too hard. What I did is I just drill into the center of each of those lights and then using an X-Acto knife, I was able to carve out everything around it really smoothly. I mean, it was not hard at all and came out really good. So those parts are now ready for me to now put back into my mold. I want to stick them down far enough and make sure that the molds are clean enough that when I put them in, they are fully touching the mold, that there's no space for anything to seep around it. At this point in time, I'm going to be using some resin, uh, not just any resin, but ClearCast, amazing resin. Uh, this is also by Illuminite, and I've used this before, it comes out really really clear but this is also one that if you don't mix it exactly right it will be sticky so for that reason I was doing some other resin things as well so I went ahead and used both bottles and even though I let them set and even though I let them drain as much as I could I still can get everything out so how exact that was is questionable but nonetheless I did stir it and I stirred it for the amount of time that you're supposed to stir it about five minutes at that point we were ready to pour it into our mold uh, very carefully only into the areas where the lights need to be so the areas that I want to be clear and then I also did a little bit of an over pour so that it will stick onto the back and uh, gives me a little bit more sturdiness so they can't just be pushed through afterwards now the downside is that this will take about 18 to 20 hours to fully dry where it won't be sticky. What do we do with that 20 hours? I mean, I could spend the time just eating Twinkies. Uh, that would be pretty good video watching, but at the same time, I can only comfortably eat a Twinkie in about 20 seconds and across 20 hours, that'd be about 3,600 Twinkies or the equivalent of one Twinkie that's about 115 feet long and, and about 366 pounds. Uh, and that's too big of a Twinkie. Now instead, I think I'm going to tell you my Ghostbusters story. See, the year that Ghostbusters came out, I was about 10 years old and I was determined to be a Ghostbuster for Halloween. And luckily, my dad was willing to go to his work and built a proton pack for me that weighed about 50 pounds and was made of wood and metal and looked awesome. It even had straps on it and I made a costume to look like one of their jumpsuits with my name on the front. It was perfect. It was, it was exactly what I wanted to do and, and as does happen, when you have exactly the costume that you want for Halloween, it snowed 
several feet. So most people chose not to even go trick-or-treating because you know that when you go trick-or-treating in the snow, your parents are gonna make you cover it up with gloves and a coat and snow pants and moon boots and a hat. And... But on the upside, I still had a proton pack that would be on the outside. So I felt pretty good about that. And of course, if you're wearing a proton pack, you gotta have the wand in your hand. And on the other hand, I'd hold my candy, so I basically had no way of stopping myself when I would slip or fall. But determined, I went from house to house, trudging up the snowy pathways and icy stairs. And finally I got to this house that had a lot of stairs. Uh, it was slightly on a hill, and so they had like two flights of stairs going up to the front door. And so I made my way up there with my 50 pound proton pack. I got to the top and I knocked on the door and the door slowly opens and there's this tall, dark figure that is standing in the doorway. And as he bent over to get a closer look, he said, who are you supposed to be? <coughs> I kill this buster. And he said, oh, really? Uh, can you come inside so I can get some pictures of you? Now, don't worry, this isn't going where you think it is. No, I, I've got my dad's downstairs. Um, I, I'd have to check with him. He's like, no, that's, that's Go get your dad, bring him back up. Uh, I've got something that I think you'll be pretty pleased to know. So we went out, I got my dad, came back up the stairs, went inside, said, I'm sorry, I just wanted to get a better picture of you uh, where you can see the costume because I want to be able to send your picture to my sister. I'm like, oh, okay. My sister was in Ghostbusters. Uh, oh, wow, Wh who'd your sister play? She played the dog. And we thought about it for a second. Is there a dog inside the... Uh, and of course he was speaking of the Teradox because his sister was Sigourney Weaver. The same Sigourney Weaver that was not only in Ghostbusters but Aliens and Avatar and a whole bunch of other shows. He even took us down to his office and showed us things that she sent him from Ghostbusters and that was pretty cool. But even cooler than that is to know that at some point in time Sigourney Weaver got a picture of me dressed in my Ghostbusters outfit. That's like my two degrees of separation for the Ghostbusters. And with that, 20 hours later, it looks like our resin is set and I'm going to take out the parts and they look awesome. Yeah, there's a little bit that got out beyond where I wanted it, but that will break right off. I can also cut it down to where I want using a razor blade. Now, as far as the backlights go, of course, they aren't supposed to be clear. So I also use some of this Mr. Color uh, Clear Red, which I like a lot. As far as my lighting kit goes, I decided to start off with the top portion. I needed to be able to get those blue lights up inside of my sirens, and in the end, I decided the best way to do that was by drilling into each of those sirens by way of the pegs, and then just sticking them inside. So we have four in the back, four in the front that are the flashing blue. There's also supposed to be a red flashing light, but unfortunately that part is solid plastic. So what I ended up doing was boring out the front of the light and then drilling up through the bottom so that now I could stick a real light into it. The kit comes with a flashing red light and I was playing around with it trying to get it in there and after doing so multiple times I ended up actually ruining the light. So that was the only red flashing light that it came with. It did have some other red lights for the brakes which I ended up sticking in there instead and then ran it in circuit with some of the blue flashing lights to make it flash. This gave me all the lights that I needed for the top and we have a switch to turn on and off those siren lights, but now I don't have enough lights for other areas of the car. And additionally, I also want to be able to have some other lights that I've been thinking about, like within the computers or in the dashboard. So after a lot of thought, I decided to bring in another set because the lights that I have on the top are also a different gauge than other lights that I have and so I brought in a whole different set of lights and decided that meant that I also would have to have a second 9 volt battery but I'll come back to that a little bit later. I wanted to be able to have a lot of little tiny lights I mean like on the computers and on the dash also these rear bullet lights would be difficult to get a light into and so for that reason I needed to use something else and I decided to go with fiber optics the nice thing about fiber optics is that they will fit into anywhere and you can light multiple with one single light. So I made holes wherever I wanted little red lights like on my radio and on the computer and I used really tiny, this isn't even the smallest one, bits. Most drill bit sets don't have bits that are this small. Uh, instead you have to get a mini or micro drill bit set to do it. But these holes are a perfect size for me to fit the fiber optics through 
and uh, glued them into place. I again actually used some of this clear red on some of those so that even when they're not lit up you can tell that they're supposed to be red. I ran two of these fiber optic cords from a red light out here to my bullet lights. The bullet lights do just pull out and you can drill into the backs of each of them so you have a little bit of space for that light to enter into and to disperse. For the dashboard I took some fiber optic, scored it like the lines that I would need for the speed and then also scraped it one time just so it would all have a little bit of a glow to it. And then I stuck it through that dash area and it also looks pretty good. I used four warm white lights in the front and two red lights in the back. At this point I noticed that there was a bit of light bleed and my bumpers didn't fully connect with the body so I used the Tamiya putty which comes in white or in silver and pretty easily fills those gaps and dries very fast and then afterwards I was able to sand them down and then paint them the way that I needed to. I took my speaker for the siren and put it underneath the hood. Then I got to my switches which I could use the ones that these came with, uh, but I didn't like these push button ones. They require too much force, and also I don't like how they look. I wanted something that looked more like it was actually part of the dashboard. So for that reason I used a couple of these switch buttons for the siren and the lights on the top. And then I used a standard switch just above the brake to be able to turn on and off the lights on the inside of the car. Now, as I mentioned, I also had to put two batteries in now, two 9-volt batteries. And I decided that the kind I wanted to use are these Castar rechargeable batteries. I like that you can recharge them using USB, and I've used them on other projects, multiple projects now, actually. They're pretty great because also they have little circuits inside that will prevent them from overdrawing or having problems. So if you actually do something that would cause a fire, it will actually turn off. This means also I could put it inside the car and I have to take them out or modify it so I can stick in and out batteries. But I also need some way to charge them and so I decided what I would do is connect them to a splitter cable and then ran that to the back of the car and put in one of these magnetic connectors where the gas cap is supposed to be. So now when I need to charge it I can actually connect what looks like a hose to my gas tank and it will supply it with the power that I need or to reset the battery as well. Now I took my glass section very carefully, masked it off, and painted white the uh, top of the roof. That way when I go to put in my wiring it'll be hidden. And then I could have it come out through the holes that I created, and then going into the parts of the car where I actually see wires inside the real car, and then set it through the floor and out to the front so that then I can connect it to my batteries. So now with everything wired up, I wanted to put on the bottom. Of course this proved to be a little bit more difficult than I thought it would be. I mean I'm trying to fit that speaker, the two batteries, and all the wiring uh, that's up there in the front and then getting it all together in such a way that uh, I'm not pinching anything or, or breaking something. It seemed like every time that I started to get the bottom on I'd realize that one of the doors was being blocked by something else on the inside so I'd have to take it off and move it around. But eventually, eventually it did click into place and I was able to screw that into place. And now all I have to do is just uh, put the rest of it together. One big problem that I ran into multiple times it has to do with this piece right here. It was kind of like that toe that you stub and the next thing you know you keep hitting it. Every single time I did something that involved the top or the car when it was attached uh, it seemed to hit it or break it or bump it and so I've glued this now about six times and luckily in the movie it looks like the wiring is zip tied onto the back so I created small zip ties which do cover up some of my cracks. I also added some additional details using some wire from uh, earphones and I put some also up here on this side so that it looks a little bit more like the movie does where they actually drip over the tanks like this. Now we can put on our ladder on this side and my hoses on this side. I also hit the hoses with a little bit of sandpaper. And with that everything is now all put together. So there's three elements that are on this car in the movie. One is rust, another one is dirt or mud, and uh, the other one is uh, dust. Starting with the rust, I decided I did want to create some more realistic rust. 
Now all that usually takes is some iron paint, the activator or catalyst, which is usually some type of salt concoction. Uh, I know that salt and vinegar seems to work for some people. Uh, in my case, I actually went with the Modern Masters kit. For this kit, you have a couple layers of primer that you put on, which actually looks pretty good as either mud or rust by itself. And I add my iron on top of that primer, a couple of layers as well. And then finally we put on our rust activator, which will build up. Look, the uh, canister was a little bit open, so some got out on the canister and look at how much of a buildup I have going on. So you check on it frequently, so you know where it is, so you can stop it in the process. I know that when I came back, I found that uh, this bumper right here was a little bit more rusted than I had intended. Same with the back over here, uh, the lights as well. But uh, you know, it still looks pretty good. I still like it. So I'm gonna stick with it. I also went around with a little bit of other paints that are mud colored and touched up my front and side a little bit more. Now if you're turning this into the original version of the Ecto-1, then you're gonna have some tint that runs at the top and the bottom of the windows going around the back and to the other side. But as I mentioned earlier, that tint in the newer movie seems to have been cracked away. Uh, of course, years of it being heated up or of it uh, cracking has led to it being peeled off in areas. And so I went around and actually looking at references as to how it generally looks in the movie too. I cut the pieces in such a way that I put it onto the windows at the top and bottom to look as if it was uh, cracking away or coming away. Now we're ready for our final phase, which brings us to this. This is just chalk. I bought a bunch of thick uh, sidewalk chalk and picked out certain colors that were browns and, and some, some earthy looking tones and had my kids smash them up until they really did a good job too. It's a really fine powder. So basically our own version of Fuller's Earth. Now before I did anything with this, the first thing I did was I took a bunch of electrical tape and cut it into the shape of basically a windshield wiper going like this. Uh, so shapes like this. And I placed those on the front window. That way it's gonna protect the window in that area from anything I'm gonna be adding to it. I experimented a little bit, first spraying some Gorilla Glue and then just using that matte adhesive again and found that using the matte adhesive, if I sprayed down the car first, then I could dash on my powder, which I did outside and it did stick and I was able to blow it off and, and brush it off to the point where it looked exactly where I wanted it. And then I hit it again uh, make sure that you're at least a couple feet away when you spray it. Otherwise, if you're too close, all that fine powder that you created is going to start to clump and it won't look like dust or dirt anymore. I peeled away the mask from the front window and it looks perfect. It looks like the front window has windshield wipers that actually work and that have been uh, scraping that away uh, just like it does in the movie. One thing that I regret is related to the window tint. I put it on the outside of the car and the reason why I did that was because I thought it would be easier for me to line it up so that it didn't go just all the way around or it didn't go outside of the window area. I thought it would look more realistic. But the downside is that when I dusted it, a lot of that dust got stuck on the cracks and so it makes them stand out more than they should. Um, I don't know, I might go back and see if I can remove that somehow a little bit. And there it is, I think it looks great. It has great detail to it with all the stickers and the paint. The thing we haven't tested yet though is my lights. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn on the lights in the front. Uh, I'm gonna just push this little switch that's over my brake and those front lights turn on, look at that, that's pretty good. It does look like they're kind of older lights and that they're behind mud. My back lights, both the bullet lights and my brake lights look pretty good too. And then if you look inside, you can see that the red computer lights are on and on the opposite side, you can also see that I have some lights on the screen. Up in the front, you can see that the radio has a couple of red lights that are on and on the dash, we can see my lit up dash. So, so, so far, everything looks pretty good. Next, I'm gonna open up the passenger side door because that's how I set it up. First, I'm gonna push down my switch to turn on the lights, which look like that. 
So we see my red flashing lights, the blue flashing lights. Then one more switch and we can hear my siren, which is the siren for the Ecto-1. So, it's pretty loud, <laughs> I will say that. Another thing that I didn't point out already is that when I was doing my details, I took the gunner seat and put a lot of detail on it. Uh, this proton pack that's on the back, I put on stickers that are related to the proton pack. Um, I weathered it. I also painted some of the areas silver uh, that needed to be. I also put a little bit of rust on the bottom in certain areas. And then the seat belt itself is supposed to be kind of a military green color. And I put that on and painted the buckles. So everything that we had planned, uh, I did do, although I did it slightly differently than I had initially planned, but I'm kind of more happy with it uh, than what my original plan was. That's usually true. And with the way that I created my power system, I could just let this sit all day uh, going, although that would eventually burn out these lights. What do you think of this? Do you have an Ecto-1? Have you upgraded your Ecto-1? Did you make it look like the original Ecto-1 instead? Let us know in the comments below. Also send us pictures if you got them. Like, subscribe, comment below. Also check out our Patreon for some of the behind the scenes and outtakes. And don't forget to stay tuned for more of your Geek Fix.